Okay, now we'll tackle a very controversial topic. It's very, very controversial. A case discussion or case conference. If palliative care or a hospice person or an ethics person or a pastor or priest is invited, half the time it's probably related to something along the lines of euthanasia or something very similar to euthanasia. So euthanasia, simply put, is you're going to end the life of someone who is um, supposedly hopelessly very sick, very injured or very incapacitated. So that's pretty much it. So, so something in that person could be a baby or um, a very sick adult or a very sick child. Something about that person makes it merciful to try to end his life. And you can do so two ways. You either do something or you don't do something that might save him or extend his life. So it's either you actively do something, right? You actively give a lethal drug that results in death. So in some countries in Europe and some states in the United States where euthanasia or mercy killing is legal, you sign all the legalities and of course it has to be really the procedure has to follow what the law requires. And the law varies depending the requirement varies depending on what place you're in. And then somebody goes to your house and administers the lethal dose of medications. In some places, they actually mail you the drug you have to take. And that's that's pretty much it. Now, in places where it's not legal, then you might be subjected to some kind of criminal sanction. Even if the person wants to end life, so that's pretty much suicide if you don't have a euthanasia law. So it's like someone wants to end their life, but then they cannot do it on their own or they don't want to, or they're too weak to figure out how to do it, and you're the nurse or the doctor or healthcare provider, and you help them, so that's like aiding and abetting suicide, right? Anyway, we'll go to the legal part uh, briefly later on. Now, passive would be you don't do anything. Like, if the patient is having problems breathing, and he needs a ventilator, and the ventilator might save their life or give them a chance of living longer, or getting better, but they don't want it, you don't give it, so it's passive. You don't do anything to cause death, but you withheld something that might have prolonged the life or saved the life of the person. So that's like passive euthanasia, right? Now, um, since we're into definitions, uh, the other one would be it's either voluntary, the person wants to die, or involuntary. Another person, other than the person whose life is going to end, or other than the person whose life is going to be ended early makes this decision to terminate the life. So it could be the family member or the mom of the kid or the mom of the baby who's about to get born, still in the womb. But for all intents and purposes, the baby looks alive and it's kind of moving and it's there in the womb. It depends on what your definition of life is. So that's a very tricky debate in many places. So that would be involuntary because the person is not making his or her own decision. So incapacitated or incompetent, right? So so the first thing that would come to your mind if you think about it is, is it okay to end the life of anyone? And if you're going to sit down and try to figure it out yourself, then your value systems will come into play and your own personal convictions and beliefs, right? Now, let's say the argument is, well, it doesn't look like it. So you can come up with a religious argument and say that, you know, there's nothing in my belief system that says it's okay to kill a person or the only time it was okay in, uh, for example, you're a Christian or Catholic Christian, the, the only time it seems okay would be when God wills it and orders it. And it doesn't look like there's any order coming from above for us to do something to the baby who's about to get born or it doesn't look like there's any big indication that God wants us to do something to this poor, very sick, incapacitated or dying patient who's going to die anyway in the next few months. So now, if you make an argument, well, you know, not all humans are the same. So that's your argument. Of course, you go beyond that belief system. It's not part of the belief system anymore. And you say, well, you know, a very deformed or a baby who's going to come out really deformed would suffer a lot. So you'll say something like that. Then might as well end their life. Now, the question is how deformed is deformed and then the experts will try to agree how deformed is deformed, but you know, it's a consensus thing. It's not like they have a foolproof measurement of how deformed is deformed enough, right? So, or the patient is very sick, and of course, how sick is very sick or dying. So, how close 
to death should you be? Um, should you be almost dead, as in like brain dead, or is vegetative enough? Or how about not vegetative, as in awake but you know getting there? So where where's the line, right? And usually it's a, a consensus kind of thing where there's no way to scientifically mark down where the line is. Now sometimes it looks like that. So for example, the definition is like heartbeat. And uh, the scientists are saying, well, you know, no heartbeat, no life, right? So, and then it's the 1970s, and this is your machine to detect the heartbeat. So, you put it so and so a number of weeks for the baby. Now, 15 to 20 years later, you have another machine, and it seems like it comes in earlier. It's just that um, our machine wasn't good enough. So, does that mean that you actually committed manslaughter or even murdered some of those babies? So, it's a moving target. And then the question is if, you're, if it's something as bad as ending a life, are moving targets good enough? Okay, so that's something you have to wrestle with on your own if you're trying to figure things out for yourself, if it looks good, ethical, right, or wrong to you. There's also someone who's not dying or is still going to live for several months, maybe even one year or two years, but, but it's very debilitating illness and, you know, life is not worth living. And, you know, of course, the law in those states where they allow euthanasia for those kinds of cases, they have to go through the psychiatrist. And, uh, I mean, it is, um, anyone who wants to pass a law has to make it foolproof, right? So, because no country in the world would just accept that kind of law without any safeguards, right? So, suffering enough and everyone's done their best. So, you have to, it's a whole bunch of interviews, assessment, and paperwork. And then you get your dose of lethal drugs, even if it looks like you're still going to live one or two years. Now, that's not legal in many places, but in some countries, it can be done. So the question is, who do you do it to? Where are the where are the lines drawn? Well, it depends on what the law states, right? Another uh, consideration would be the, the voluntary and involuntary thing. What if um, the patient really wants it? You know, this end my life because so-and-so. There's the autonomy part. The right to die movement, you know, they decide when you want to die and how you want to die. So that's that's kind of um, the idea, the, the autonomy, self-determination argument. It might be the patient or it might be the patient's family telling everyone that this is what the patient wants before he or she became incompetent, okay, sending the patient. Somewhat involuntary because you're not hearing it from the patient himself or herself. Now, of course, if you make an argument, they're just telling you what they heard from the patient, then, you know, it's it's somewhat voluntary. So that's the autonomy part, you know. They want it. They know exactly what the deal is, and they want it. Now, of course, the autonomy is not supreme when it comes to ending people's lives, right? So just because they want to die, it doesn't mean it's perfectly ethical or legal, right? Suicide is a person who wants to die, right? So actually um, euthanasia for someone who wants to die so that would be voluntary euthanasia would be assisted suicide right that's pretty much what it is of course nobody wants to use that term because it sounds bad right you know someone wants to die and you kind of help this person die so you assist the suicide now all attempts are made not to use the word suicide because it carries a lot of connotation especially in countries where they want to do it and they just say it say it's a voluntary euthanasia Actually, people also avoid using mercy killing, even if you have the mercy word, killing doesn't sound so good. So euthanasia is like, uh, it doesn't carry the killing word and doesn't carry the suicide word. So that's pretty much how it is. If you want to do something, you might as well put a label that's not going to cause a lot of concern from the general population, right? But it's the same thing, obviously. Now, there's also a very difficult to pin down kind of ar argument, like, you know, we should be compassionate, look at the suffering and, and things like that. So it's the compassion. Usually the compassion idea doesn't stand on its own. Usually you need some kind of autonomy to back it up, right? And you also need some kind of description that the patient is too far gone, um, that the potential life, so if you're killing a, a baby who's about to get born, or the life ahead if you're killing someone who's very debilitated or has advanced illness who is a limited prognosis anywhere between one month to one year or two years or suffering a lot is not worth living, right? So that would be compassion. So it's it's an additional argument for euthanasia. So meaning if you're going to go to your Congress begging them to pass a law on euthanasia so, so that you don't get charged with murder or aiding and abetting suicide or manslaughter, 
then you give those kinds of arguments, right? Of course, the question can be asked, um, especially in the real world, like the, the way things are being done right now is withholding or withdrawing life prolonging measures. There's also a little bit of conflict of interest in both. Um, the patient's there, there's nothing to do, you're not ordering a whole bunch of tests, MRIs, or CT scans, which earns a lot of money for the institution and maybe even for the doctor, you're just waiting it out. There's that concern. Hopefully, it's not a big concern, but in a place where the medical industry and medical business side of things is supreme, you cannot avoid those kinds of reasons. Hopefully, in your place, it's not the main reason, or doctors are still somewhat ethical and moral in a non-business-like manner. So in those more or less um, ethically and morally corrupted places, you can easily ask, well, you know, if you're so compassionate, how come this is how you were treating the patient before you decided that you want to end the patient's life or before you decided that you want to turn off the ventilator? It doesn't look compassionate to us. So meaning you're just using the word compassion just to get the policy passed or just to get the law passed, right? So now, and then the question from an ethical and moral standpoint is, can a person who has no real compassion do a compassionate act or use the argument of compassion to get something done? So I won't go any further. So, but you know, it's something for you to think about. Like, can a person who's really not compassionate and who is acting not very compassionate to the patient or to the patients, or can an institution is not really too compassionate to its patients use a compassionate kind of reason to get a law or policy passed to compassionately end the person's life by doing something or withdrawing something or withholding something? Or do they have the right to use the word compassion to begin with? Now, the other word that's being used is dignity. Okay, something for you to, you know, like sit down and meditate and think about. Now, of course, the other argument would be, well, the person is already dead. Then how come you're using a ventilator when the person is already dead? Now, the person is already dead because the brain is dead. Okay, so that's brain death. Now, um, that's the easiest one to do euthanasia on. And the person is not really, of course, the, the easiest one to do euthanasia on. The less complicated one is someone who's already dead because you're not killing anyone. The person is already dead. So the next best thing is the one closest to death, meaning brain death, irreversible brain death. If you think that the personhood or life is connected to the brain, right? Now, of course, it's it didn't come as easy as that because the heart is still beating and the lungs are uh, is still working with your ventilator so is the patient already dead now of course is it okay to end the life of someone who's already, who's brain dead right now for babies you might think of someone who's born with not a lot lot of brain like an encephalus but the brain stem is intact the baby's kind of breathing of course they won't last long is it okay to withhold everything so that the baby dies a lot more quickly or still do the same thing you would do to a baby who doesn't have that kind of abnormality, right? Other considerations would be, you know, what your moral convictions are. Not just you, but the moral convictions prevalent in your country or in that society, right? In some places, especially in metropolitan areas of developing countries, the institution has a culture and has values and moral convictions which are not in tune with the moral convictions and values of the general population, especially if the institution is trying to achieve some kind of, you know, Western, modern kind of development. You know, they, they want to be globally known and they want to be advanced. And in their mind, advanced means Western, modern medicine advanced. So they, they try to do that. So the modern, Western, advanced country values, which is not in sync with the general sentiments and moral convictions and values of the society or majority of the people in their own country. That's a big topic. We won't go into that. There's religious considerations, especially if you're in a place or a society or a country that's still very religious. Even in Western countries, um, majority of the population is still religious. Although you have a very loud, very aggressive, secular, non-religious group, even in those places, the majority of the population is usually uh, fairly religious. And, and if it's Western civilizations, it's mostly along the Christian or Catholic Christian sense, right? Now, if you go against uh, the society or the country, then that causes a lot of problems also. You know, imagine if doctors are, are doing 
a little bit of withholding treatment here and there, even if it's not legal. And actually, it does happen. Even in Western countries, people have been doing it quietly even before the law has been passed. Of course, if you get caught, then you're looking at either murder or aiding and abetting suicide or manslaughter. But it's been done. I won't say which country or which countries, or it's being done. And of course, I won't say which countries or which institutions or which places. So that's my disclaimer. But it happens even before the actual law is passed. Now, of course, some people will say, well, well, there's kind of a law, you know, like we can actually end the life of someone who's not brain dead but very close to death because we we need to salvage the kidney if it's the kidney donor but you know that's a special case um, not everyone is a kidney donor now if you, the person is not a kidney donor and you're just using the law to justify what you did for a person who's not a kidney donor then the law on organ transplant or organ donation does not make euthanasia legal what it is, is that's what your lawyer will use to defend you once you get caught, right? So it doesn't make it legal. So you can be charged still. But then once you get charged and you hire a lawyer, that's probably what your lawyer will use. Or if you go to Congress, that's one of the things that you will use to convince the Congress to pass a euthanasia law, right? So that's how things work. Now, the other consideration, of course, is the slippery slope consideration there's no way to stop its use and we've seen that happen you know even when you talk about babies or babies about to be born or uh, fetus or abortion you know it was passed and um, the argument is for these particular cases which sounds kind of okay to a good portion of the population or at least a decent um, number or percentage of the population but then it became abused and and then suddenly people are doing abortion all over the place and coming up with loopholes in between, right? So that's the concern, potential for abuse, especially if you are in a country where there's a state of lawlessness, meaning it's very difficult to enforce the law. And then you pass something like this and um, the moral convictions of the institutions and the uh, healthcare professionals cannot be completely trusted, then you're looking at the potential disaster you know in nazi germany it's medical organizations and institutions and medical experts backing up the idea of genocide with some kind of scientific basis so it can be abused right so just for a quick review manslaughter is another term for homicide which is less severe than murder Okay, so what do you mean by less severe? Then, for example, assisted suicide in some places can be considered murder. It's just as bad in some places, especially in the United States. They'll say, well, you know, it's out of compassion. It's a different case and the, the patient's like this and, and there's uh, autonomy. So it's manslaughter, not murder, right? So assisted suicide or euthanasia can be considered manslaughter. Now, in other countries, it's perfectly legal. They have the law on euthanasia or assisted suicide. Obviously, if you're in a country with absolutely no laws, then you can easily get charged with something, either murder or manslaughter or aiding and abetting suicide, right? Now, this one would be a non-medical example. So another manslaughter is somebody enters your house and you're so scared and um, you think that person can kill you so you shot the person it's a voluntary thing you actually intended to kill but you know you thought wrong you were just scared the person actually won't be able to kill you it's really not it they were just so emotionally concerned and temporary mental mentally disturbed then that's voluntary manslaughter why is it not murder because they thought they can get killed those are voluntary manslaughters. The involuntary would be killing someone without the intent of doing so so it's like an accidental killing for example you're driving a car and then and then you, you saw a yellow light and then you sped up and then you ran a red light and then you accidentally hit someone crossing the street or accident, accidentally hit the car and the driver dies. So that's involuntary manslaughter because you don't have any intention of killing the driver. Now what might be related to medical practice or healthcare practice would be negligent homicide or the involuntary manslaughter related to being criminally negligent. So, for example, medical malpractice that ends in death. Malpractice means you have a duty to do something and you failed to perform your duty and it led to death. Now, 
there's also uh, such a thing as it applies to some doctors because alcoholism and drug abuse is becoming more and com- more and more common. So there's also such a thing as um, practicing while under the influence of drugs or intoxication. Obviously, the person who is intoxicated or under the influence of drugs has no intention of actually killing the patient most of the time. But he ended up doing so because he was practicing under the influence of the drug or the alcohol. Then that would be involuntary manslaughter so we'll probably end there and we'll just do another more complete session from a a more legal perspective or a longer discussion on the legalities of euthanasia later on